Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Midday Weather Outlook for the Southern Region, brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, most of our videos this fall are going to start off with an animation like this, which is looking at the tropics and activity that we're seeing here from infrared satellite. And clearly, uh, across the main development region, you know, of course, right in through here, we're watching quite a lot of active tropical uh, thunderstorm activity. What we're looking for here is organization. In other words, large clusters of thunderstorms, as seen here by very bright colors here, uh, and, and, and those cold cloud tops organizing, beginning to rotate, beginning to form a center of circulation because just to see tr tropical convection is normal but it's to see the organization of this that we really want to be taking uh, care uh, to watch for so we have two broad areas we're watching most carefully these two right in through here and uh, at this particular point neither has really had the wave which we talked about last week kind of closing off into a circulation and what I was waiting for this morning uh, which is why my video is a little bit later than normal is I wanted to see the latest discussion uh, from the National Hurricane Center so uh, once I've got the 8 a.m. Uh, stuff in we started processing this and taking a closer look and I, I tend to agree with what they're saying here right now just to give you some numbers they're giving this particular wave about a 60% chance of developing in the next five days and the one behind it about a 90% chance of developing one of the reasons why the wave out ahead of this going through the Caribbean uh, it's got a lower probability in the near term is simply because in the Caribbean this time of year uh, due to several things, including the Caribbean gyre, including what goes on with winter in the Caribbean, it, it tends to be a less um, hospitable environment for tropical cyclone development. But I think once this particular wave gets south of Jamaica, uh, we may possibly start to be looking for it to, um, you know, it, it to begin to close up a circulation. So it's it's conducive, but not the best environment. And then the concern will be what happens when this comes over to the Yucatan Peninsula and possibly gets into the Gulf of Mexico, or will the steering currents possibly we pull it into Mexico, preventing it from getting into the Gulf. The second system on the backside, as you can see there, is taking a very similar track to like the systems you saw earlier in the year, like Isai is coming north over to head kind of north of the Lesser Antilles. And as we look out over the next five days, we, what we see here from the European model is uh, the probability of forming a tropical depression. So remember, it goes a tropical disturbance. That's where we have the thunderstorms in place. Tropical depression, when we get a closed low and sustained winds above 22 miles an hour. Then it gets um, to become a tropical storm when it has sustained winds above 39 miles an hour and of course a closed low and then a hurricane is when it's 74 miles an hour or faster so we we base all of those off of sustained wind speeds so we're looking here at tropical depression probability and we do see about an 80 percent chance on the backside system here and then as this one by the time we get into days two through five gets over into this part of the caribbean uh, again the question will be how does it interact with central america getting into the yucatan peninsula but do notice on the back side of this the, the waves coming off of Africa are not slowing down anytime soon so if I take you now out to day five through eight so this would of course go through middle of next week uh, what we're watching uh, carefully here will be the, the 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 wave that was in the back will be here and we're still keeping a close eye in this region on the leading wave the one that had the 60 percent chance in either case, both of these systems have the potential for having an impact on uh, the Gulf Coast or in Florida or along the East Coast. At this particular point, there's it's not possible to be able to project where they're going to be with any sort of accuracy, both in their placement or in their strength. Uh, it is suggested right now from the models that they will likely not uh, quickly intensify such that we're going to have a major concern early over these systems being quite strong. And I can show you that in a couple of different ways. Let's just look at this one. This is looking over the next 10 days at tropical cyclone tracks. And we can see uh, where, I'll just kind of wrap these up into two envelopes here. There's this one and then there's the second one that's following it. We notice that the, the wave that the National Hurricane Center is given a 90% probability of forming uh, into a tropical depression does have a better chance at getting over toward Florida between Florida and Louisiana, but possibly up the East Coast as well, toward the Carolinas. So uh, it's still several days out, and we're just going to watch it very carefully to see how it evolves over the coming days here. But um, I'll tell you, with, with the high-pressure cell, so I just want you to see this. The main high-pressure cell, by the time we get to, to Saturday evening, is here. But can, you can see this elongated uh, pressure ridge that extends clear over into um, almost just here off the East Coast. In fact, if I get that last drawing off there, can you see this secondary area through here where there will be locally some higher pressure. 
Now why I just bring this up is this is what's going to help steer these systems farther to the south rather than allowing them to curl back out to open ocean. Because normally when we get this big high pressure cell over here, we don't often see you know a complementary hide that's sitting right off of the coast. Why we're seeing that though right now is simply because of the way the western part of the United States is blocked up, plus where the troughs are as they move through parts of the eastern side of North America. So I, long story short, the pattern is, is, is conducive to allowing these systems to get close to the United States, but at this point, we're just too early in, in the game here to make a projection on how strong they could possibly be. I certainly think we could get quite a bit of precipitation out of them. Now today, we're still dealing with that larger ridge that's in the western part of the United States, and we're getting flow that comes over the top of it just like this. And in general, there's troughing here across the, the eastern part of our southern region. Uh, you can also see uh, there are quite a, there is quite a bit of tropical activity here. Uh, this is Genevieve right into this area that it's actually going to come up here toward the Baja, maybe even given some of its remnants to California. We'll talk more about that in my Western report here in a few moments. So as I think forward about this precipitation forecast first, I want to just take a look back over the last couple of weeks. Much of South uh, and Central Texas has been very, very dry, and there are pockets in Louisiana that have been very dry as well, despite the fact that large thunderstorm clusters had come out in the last couple of weeks over parts of Oklahoma and Arkansas. When you get east of there, due to the scattered nature of the storms that have been across parts of Tennessee, also across parts of Mississippi and Alabama, and Florida and Southern Georgia, we have some places in there that did not get some of the heavy rains from some of these storms. But you can clearly see going through parts of northern Georgia into the Appalachian Mountains and through uh, parts of North and South Carolina to Virginia, things have been extremely wet. Some of our numbers here are up in the 250 to 350% range on total accumulated precip. So the question is, how much rain are we expecting over the next week? We're going to look at it three different ways here. This is from the uh, Weather Prediction Center, so this is part of NOAA. That scattered thunderstorm regime we keep talking about here over the southeast continues as there's wide open Gulf of Mexico moisture transfer transport and with high pressure that sometimes builds over the Great Lakes combined with where that high is out over the Atlantic, we just kind of sandwich the air in between, force it to rise and just there's quite a bit of thunderstorm activity. But notice as you get back toward the Delta and then over to Texas, the chances of storms drops dramatically. And while we will still see isolated thunderstorm events as you go back farther into the western part of our southern region, it will not be with the widespread coverage we're going to be having over parts of the southeast. So the other two ways to look at it, this is uh, just the GFS on the left and the European on the right. These are the operational model runs. And what we're looking at here is precipitation anomalies. So I'm trying to get some agreement out of the models here. And so what we notice is that both of them agree very well on this particular area that we have circled here as having above average precipitation. Um, what they don't agree on is Florida. As you can see there, the GFS over there on the uh, left is much drier for Florida than the European. And it's partly because of what the GFS is attempting to do with that lead wave that was going through the Caribbean. You can see the GFS very aggressive about bringing it north of the Yucatan and potentially into the Gulf of Mexico. Now remember, I'm calling this into question quite a bit here because this is just a single operational model run. Uh, outside of that, go back over to the uh, South Central Plains, uh, getting into over toward the Delta. While we see drier conditions, I just want to remind you, we will still continue to get pop-up clusters of thunderstorms. There's nothing over that area that is completely suppressive of the atmosphere not producing thunderstorms uh, of some variety in that region. So if we go over to the operational European, I'm going to play it for you first as we've been doing. You can just see the greens popping almost daily here over the southeast. You can see that the operational European model, so this is interesting, uh, as, I, as I bring this out, uh, we'll go back to the beginning here in a few moments, but as I bring this out, this is next Sunday, the 23rd, getting into Monday now, next Tuesday and Wednesday. So a week from now, you can see the operational, the operational only European wants to bring the system that is in um, the Caribbean right here into the Gulf, even though as you saw, several of the other ensemble members want to keep it farther to the south. It's not got it as a strong system, which is good, but plenty of moisture certainly on one side of it. And then you also notice that the models are bringing in the second system here uh, into this area by a week, uh, almost 10 days from now, excuse me, next Thursday, uh, right in through this area. But if we come back to the beginning of this animation, okay, we're working our way through the day today, scattered storms in parts of the Ohio Valley and also down here along the Gulf of coast in Florida. So that's pretty routine uh, precipitation patterns there. As we get ourselves into Wednesday morning, afternoon, and evening, there it is. You're just going to see sandwich between this high pressure cell here and this high pressure cell here. There's a weak boundary and on that we're going to get a lot of thunderstorm pop-up thunderstorm activity. Drier as you go west though. 
From there, we just play this through to Thursday afternoon and evening, getting now into Friday afternoon and evening. And it's almost like one of those wash, rinse, repeat patterns as we get into the, the next uh, several days here. When does it possibly change? Well, by next, I got you out to next Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon and evening. There is a bit stronger of a front that's trying to come through the Corn Belt. We'll have to wait to see if it does. Could start to shove things around a little bit. But what it did do is it got rid of the big high that was sitting here. And as a result, we, we see less defined lifting along this region and through here, which means the models are not going to pick up on a stronger precipitation signal. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at the operational model, let's just go out to the day 10 pattern. Our models are kind of in agreement, but they are not in agreement in terms of the magnitude. GFS is on the left. You can see that it really flattens out the ridge over the southwest, actually brings in a trough here and a much deeper trough into the northeastern part of the United States. The European has similar features, but the upstream pattern for the southeast especially is a lot different. So take a look at the difference here. Look at the broader ridge there, and the trough is much farther off of the northeast coast here. And as a result, these two models are giving us much different precipitation patterns for the next five days. So let's go from here to day 15. You see that progression of that pattern drops a broader trough into the west for the European and extends a larger ridge spreading across our southern region. Whereas the European still keeps the ridge focused here and the flow comes around it. So the end result is this in terms of precipitation for week two. You can see that the GFS is drier, farther to the west you go, whereas the European, keeping that ridge farther back here, tends to open things up more out of the Gulf of Mexico. And I'll get my drawings up there just so you can see it again, that it's, it's a bit of a wetter model look into the very last week here of the month of August. So we're going to watch this uh, carefully just because there is some model discrepancies here that are worth noting. And we need to see which of these models has got a better handle on this. Let's talk temperatures. If we just play this forward, you're going to see a lot of the same things. Ready? The heat is, is pretty much out west. We see near average to slightly cooler than average weather across the southeast. And it tends to stay there all the way through the next week. Watch it again. So this is Tuesday to next Monday. And those temperatures, a lot of upper 80s I see over the southeast. And as we get back into Texas, those temperatures get up, of course, toward the century mark in western Texas, which again is just a few degrees above average. From there though, let's go out and look at the 6 to 10 day forecasts. Interesting differences here between the European and the GFS. Remember how deep that trough was in the GFS? Well, you can see the cooler weather there, and as a result, it doesn't allow the warmth to extend far in this direction. So in result, more of our southern region sees near average temperatures. The European keeping a broader ridge out west uh, now allows more of that heat to spread into this area and we see better chances for near average to above average temperatures in the 6 to 10 day. But to be honest, when you look at this, these deviations are relatively small. So to say that there's huge discrepancies for the southern region is, is not really a, a wise thing for me to say. Going out beyond that into the uh, 11 to 15 day time period, Remember, the, the GFS really a much broader trough in through here than the European had, and that's simply why you see some of these temperature differences looking out uh, this, this far. But still, across our southern region, it's going to be the same thing we've been seeing. Nearer to average in the southeast, warmer in Texas. That, that seems to be the way it's playing out uh, over the next 15 days. Now let's look longer term. Got the brand new European weeklies last night. I want to make a comment about that area in the upper right hand image that I've kind of shaded in there. Uh, this has been an area that the models I feel have struggled with for the last six weeks and it's not in agreement with what the CFSV2 model says. The European just wants to paint really from much of North America a warmer than average picture as we uh, begin the month of September. It's also not doing much to close off the Gulf of Mexico. And as you can see there, uh, you don't get a strong precipitation signal in either the week three or week four forecast uh, that could be potentially dry. And that would be what we would be on the lookout for is really, really dry and hot conditions. To back this forecast up, I want to show you the same maps, but now we're looking from the CFSV2. The CFSV2, once again, you can see in the week three, week four precipitation maps, which are over here on the left, see the wetter conditions in through here and also wet along the Gulf Coast, but this is not a strong dry signal. And the uh, CFSV2, look at this, it wants to bring in much cooler weather in here, week three, and then really keep it established across much of our southern region into week four while the heat backs up to the west. So the European model here is really biting into a larger ridge forming in the western United States, and it's done this for the last couple of model runs.
but we'll have to watch most carefully is what the MJO does. So as you can see, as we've been talking about, it appears that it's going to slow down a bit right here over phase one and two again, giving us that standing wave over Africa. A couple of things to note, as we talked about in yesterday's video, we've got a couple more days now of information. And what we can see is maybe some stronger trade winds showing up at times just north of um you know, of Indonesia in that region. And as a result of that, that's possibly going to give our La Nina maybe better chances than what I gave it yesterday. Uh, but overall, this this particular pattern in the Pacific Ocean is, is a relatively stagnant one where the La Nina and the MJO are not necessarily working in hand, hand in hand together. So uh, what I'll do here is I'll wrap it up. I'm going to start preparing my long range briefing for tomorrow. And until then, I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thanks.